And I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation. You notice the title there, a very uh, edgy title perhaps. The actual, the certain, the unavoidable identity of Jesus? Is that No, last night we talked about the identity of the Messiah. Interesting. The identity of the Antichrist. Now, right away, I'm I'm sure you're scratching your heads. Wait a second. We're actually going to talk about... We are. But we're not interested in what I have to say. We're not interested in what uh, uh, maybe an individual has to think. Like Dr. Youngberg put put it so well, we're interested in what the Bible has to say. Because hopefully, night after night, we've seen a common theme. We've been building on something, and that is this, that the Bible has answers. Very simple, but, but it's true. The Bible has answers. We've seen that this book is, is something we can trust. It's something that is reliable. Time and time again, we've seen that the Bible has proven its claim to be a remarkable revelation from God. And so tonight, we're interested in what the Bible has to say. Now, hopefully, most of you received a study guide. Did you receive the study guide? Yes? If you'll pull that out, uh, this will be very important. We're going to follow this a little more closely tonight. And there's some, some, some blanks for you to fill in. So maybe take out a pen. Hopefully there's a pen in front of you and that, that pew in front of you. Get out your Bibles because we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say tonight. Now, even before we begin, I want to have a word of prayer. And like we've said, we're, we pray to the author of the book to help us understand his book. And so we're asking God, Lord, help us to understand what your word has to say. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we want to humbly approach this subject tonight. Because, God, we realize that we don't have answers, but we we know that you do. And so, Lord, as as we very humbly approach the Bible, as, as we look at what your word has to say, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us. I pray that you would give us the clear light of understanding. And Lord, I pray that Jesus may be seen tonight. And Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, we want to begin by looking there at that first paragraph. Pull that study out. We're going to read that first paragraph. It says, follow along. This lesson, and it says the following lesson. You can ignore that part. This lesson will address the very important you have the Antichrist from a biblical perspective. A what perspective, everyone? A biblical perspective. Conjectures, opinions, and ideas about the identity of the Antichrist abound. And most of them, unfortunately, are not from the Bible. We are not interested in these. We want to know the truth. We want to know what the Bible actually teaches. This is, of course, a serious topic. This is important. Pay attention. We want to be sure to be honest and humble in our study. God will richly bless us if we do. And so to begin, I want to to, to ask you to open your Bibles and turn to John chapter 17 and there in verse 3. John chapter 17 and there in verse 3. It's also on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, turn with me. The book of John, that fourth gospel there, John chapter 17 and verse 3. John chapter 17, verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. This is a very simple text concerning salvation. I would say uh, one of the simpler texts about salvation in the Bible. It says, and this is eternal life. Here it is right here. This is salvation. That they may, what's that word, everyone? Know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Did you catch that? This is salvation that you may know. So we could say very simply that, that knowing God is salvation. Knowing God, having a faith relationship with God, having a friendship with God, according to the Bible, says salvation. Salvation. Knowing God is salvation. So could we say not knowing God is not salvation? Could could we say that? Fair enough. If, if, If salvation is knowing God, then not knowing God is not salvation. Not having a friendship, a faith relationship in our Lord Jesus Christ is not salvation according to this verse. And we are going to see the reason that we we look at this text is two reasons. The first reason is that we are going to to see that that, that Satan has an attack against knowing God. If, 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 If it is the goal of salvation to know God, then obviously Satan's attack is against us 
truly knowing God. That makes sense. I mean, he doesn't want us to have salvation. And so if salvation is knowing God, then the devil says, I don't want you to know God. But the second reason I show you this text at the beginning is this. My friends, knowing who the Antichrist is will not save you. Knowing who Jesus Christ is will save you. Amen? Amen. Now this is an important topic because we're going to see that this Antichrist power is used to, 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 to get in the way of us knowing God. But like I said, knowing Jesus is essential to our salvation. Amen? Now, now many, many say, well, hey, this is going to be easy. We said this a couple nights ago. This is going to be easy. Antichrist. Anti means against. So we're going to be looking for this power that's going to be against Christ. Aha, there we have it, the Antichrist. But I think that is an oversimplistic definition of the Antichrist. Notice what anti actually means. Now, before uh, we, we, we go to that point, um, I want you to realize that the ascent the essence of deception is that you are unaware you're being deceived. The essence of deception, this is important, the essence of deception is that you are unaware of being deceived. Let me explain. When you are asleep, do you know that you're asleep? When, when I'm there in bed, oh, I'm sleeping. The moment I awake, ah, oh, I was just sleeping. In order to realize that you are asleep, you have to have the knowledge of being awake. Right? That makes sense. Go try it at home sometime. You'll realize that you have no knowledge. Oh, I'm sleeping, snoring. But then when you wake up, ah, I was asleep. So in order to, to realize that, okay, I was asleep, you have to be awake. In order to be undeceived or, or to not be deceived, you have to realize you're being deceived. I mean, no one comes in here and says with a big sign around their neck, I am being deceived. Right? right? Because that would mean that they would know they're being deceived which is opposite of the definition of deception, which is you don't know, right? That makes sense. And so we're, 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 we're painting this picture that, okay, deception, in order to truly understand and not be deceived, the cure for deception is the Bible. The cure for deception is the Bible. Notice your study, guys. It says there, that second paragraph, are you deceived? Are you sure? The reason we ask that question is because there might be some that say, oh, I'm not deceived. Are you sure? And that's the point. The reason we put that question is because, hey, do you, how do you know you're not deceived? Notice what the Bible says. It says the, or this, this, this uh, study guide said, it says the essence of deception is that you're unaware you're being deceived. That's what makes deception so sticky. We're reading along. After all, no one says, hey, I'm being deceived right now. If no one knows he's being deceived, it ceases to be deception. You may be sitting thinking to yourself, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not deceived, but the problem is that is exactly how deceived people think. How can we be sure that we will remain undeceived? Simple, be sure that what you believe is consistent with the Bible. The Bible is, you can fill in that blank, the cure for deception. Many of you remember the second night we looked at signs of the times. Jesus is, is coming again here, and, and, and there's signs that are pointing to that fact. And one of them, we looked at a a, a man by the name of Jose de Jesus Miranda. He claims to be Jesus on earth. And in fact, he has some 5 million followers. And they go around saying, here is Jesus. They say it plain. You can go to his website. Now, do those individuals, those followers of this man, do, do they know they're being, I mean, they, to them, he's Jesus. So lo, us looking on saying they're being deceived, but they don't think they're being deceived. How do they become undeceived? By talking to him? No, no, no. By going to the Bible. And so we're hitting that point over and over. We want to see what the Bible has to say. We want to see what the Bible has to say. Now, back to my earlier point. Notice the definition of anti or against. Look at there from the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Two definitions. A, instead of or because of or in the room of. B, often used in composition to denote contrast, requital, substitution, correspondence, etc. So A definition is instead of, B definition in substitution. Interesting. So maybe this idea that the Antichrist against Christ is maybe not that accurate at all. Maybe it's more an idea of in substitution or, or in place of. Okay, that makes sense. 
And we want to further develop that idea by going to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. You can turn there in your Bible. It's also up on the screen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. We looked at this verse the other night. And here Paul talks about the Antichrist, but he uses some different names. Go there to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4. Notice what Paul says. There in verse 3, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the what? The falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. The, what is that term he uses? The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above. Wait a second. I thought you just said that the Antichrist is not going to be against or oppose Christ. But listen, notice how he continues. He says, he opposes, he exalts himself of all that is called God or that is worshiped so that as he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he's against God, that he is God. Interesting, fascinating. Here, here Paul shows us, hey, the Antichrist, he calls him the son of perdition, must come before the day, before the second coming. Okay, Paul, Paul assures us, hey, we're going to be looking for this Antichrist power, but what are we going to be looking for? What, what are we watching for? Well, he says here, maybe this, this figure is not going to be a violent opposer, but a subtle betrayer. And may, maybe he's not going to, to come up here and, and, and boastfully pound against Christ, but maybe he'll come from within. Now, notice that phrase there up on the screen, the son of, what's that word? Perdition. That's an interesting phrase. Would you believe it that in the Bible, there's only two places where that's used? How many places, everyone? Two. Only two places. Here is one of them. The other is found in the book of John. Go there to John chapter 17, verse 12. We are in just in John chapter 17, verse 3. So go back to John now. We're jumping around, skipping around. John's chapter 17. And notice what Jesus says. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Or excuse me, verse 12. This is what he says in verse 12. And this is Jesus praying, okay? Giving you a context. Jesus is praying here. He's praying to God the Father. And he says, while I was with them in the world. Who's, who's them? Who's, who's Jesus talking? Who could he be talking to while I was with them in the world? The disciples. He's talking about, while I was with the disciples in the world, I kept them in your name. I kept them. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them, none of those disciples are lost, Jesus is saying, except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Interesting. Jesus says, hey, I was with my disciples. I kept them. They were my friends. They followed me along. We know that. Well, go to the Gospels. We can find the disciples going along, following Jesus. But there was one, Jesus says, who was not saved. Who, 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 who was the one that was not saved? Judas. Judas Iscariot. We, we know that story well. Judas betrayed his own master. And so here we find that that phrase, the, the son of perdition is used in two places for two individuals, Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. Why? Why? Why, Why would Paul use that language? Here he's writing many years after, after, after this had happened, but he's still thinking about that moment, thinking about what Jesus had said. Well, we know that Judas did, did he come from the Romans? Did he come as a Pharisee coming in there against Christ? I'm going to capture Christ and coming and tying him up. Is that how Jude? No. Judas came from within the inner circle of Christ. He came and he betrayed Christ. He was friendly. Uh, he was one of the disciples, but he betrayed his own master. And so we see here the son of perdition compared to Judas and the Antichrist, that the Antichrist will not appear as a violent opposer but as a subtle imposter you catch the difference not as a violent opposer but as a subtle imposter or betrayer and i don't think it's coincidence at all that both paul and jesus use the same language interesting parallel fascinating that this figure is not going to come against but but from within the inner circle from from maybe appear friendly at first that's what the bible is saying we're, we're painting this picture. 
But then notice there on the second page, turn to that second page of your study guide. And there's a big, bold title. It says the threefold office of Jesus Christ. The threefold office. Now, the, the reason that we are going here is this. We just learned in John 17 that to know God is to, 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 to know God is salvation, right? And didn't Jesus himself say that, 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 that we can come to the Father through Jesus, right? We come to the Father through Christ. And so wouldn't it be natural that, that Jesus wants to attack knowing Christ? If we come to the Father through Christ, maybe, maybe then the devil wants to usurp and take what is rightfully Christ. And we saw that just a couple nights ago, we looked at this, this theme called the great controversy or this great conflict, this battle between good and evil, this, this battle between God and Satan. And we saw that Satan longs for worship. He longs for worship. Do you remember there when, when, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness? Remember, he went in the wilderness 40 days. He was there and, and he was tempted on three different accounts. And the last account, there, there Satan takes Jesus up onto this high hill, shows him the whole land and says, Jesus, if you want all of this, bow down to me. Satan has the nerve, the audacity to ask his own creator, Jesus Christ himself, to worship him. The devil wants worship, and he doesn't care how he gets it. And so we want to see, well, how is he, how is he going to do that? Notice in Matthew 12, 41. Will you turn there with me? Matthew 12, 41. These verses won't be on the screen, so I'd invite you to turn there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Matthew 12, verse 41. Matthew 12, verse 41. And it says here, the men of Nineveh, Nineveh, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of who? Jonah. And indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. One greater than Jonah is here. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He, he's talking to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees. And they are familiar with Jonah. You guys remember the story of Jonah, don't you? There, there God tells Jonah, hey, you need to go to Nineveh and you need to preach your heart out because they're a wicked city. Well, Jonah is scared out of his mind, just like any of us, man. I, I don't want to go and, 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 and preach to some wicked city and, hey, repent. I mean, that's a scary thing. So Jonah runs away. And he, he, he gets on that ship and he's trying to sail away. But God has a different plan. He gets thrown overboard. And what happens? That big fish, that big whale swallowed him up. He's there for, for three days and three nights. Then he gets spit back out onto the land. Crazy story. It actually happened. But then, he, okay, Jonah says, all right, God, I'll go to Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. The entire city repents. Woo, what a prophet. The entire city repents. And in the Jewish mindset, here they're looking at Jonah, and they're saying, that was a prophet. You want to talk about a prophet, he preached to an entire city and the whole city repented. Woo! But Jesus is saying, mm mm mm. I am greater than Jonah. I am greater than the greatest prophet. Interesting. Interesting. Jesus making a claim. He's telling the Jewish people, hey, one who is greater than Jonah is here. But notice what he says next. Notice there in the next verse, verse 42. Verse 42 of chapter 12, it says, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, one greater than Solomon is here. Who was Solomon? Solomon was the wisest man in the world. He was the greatest king. In the Jewish minds, there was a king. And Jesus says, hey, I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater than the greatest king. But notice, lastly, backing up to verse 6, that same chapter, verse 6, chapter 12, notice what Jesus says. Verse 6, chapter 12, he says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Interesting. 
Here, here uh, Jesus says, hey, I'm greater than the greatest prophet. I'm greater than the greatest king. I'm greater than the greatest priest who ministers in the same. I'm greater than the temple itself because the temple pointed to Christ. Inter- here we find the three-fold ministry of Jesus. We find that, that Jesus is prophet. What's a prophet? Well, a prophet is one who speaks for God. Over and over in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we find phrases like, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. The prophets were God's spokesmen. They spoke for God. The priest ministered for God, and the king ruled for God. Interesting. Jesus says here, listen, I am greater than the greatest prophet. I'm greater than the greatest priest. I'm greater than the greatest king. I speak for God, I minister for God, and I rule for God. The threefold office or ministry of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find something interesting this evening. The, the Antichrist power wants to take this place. We're going to look at that. The threefold ministry of Jesus. Greater than the greatest prophet. Greater than the greatest. Greater than the priest himself, greater than the priest himself. Ooh, we had a light fall, that's all right. We can, uh, we can get that in a second. Interesting. But notice here that if you look in the entire Bible, you look from start to finish, you're only going to find five names given for the Antichrist, only five. You, 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 you search the entire Bible from, from back to, to front, from front to back, the cover to cover, and you're going to find five different names. There's only one place that actually says the Antichrist. And you find that in 1 John, just in 1 John. And it's just mentioned briefly. We already looked at a few nights ago that the beast is in Revelation 13. We just looked at Paul. He he said, he says, hey, the Antichrist, his name is the man of sin and the son of perdition. But there's one more name that is given in the Bible. And that is the little horn. And you're thinking to yourself, how in the world is that a name for the the Antichrist, the little horn? That's weird. Stay with me. You are going to see that the little horn is precisely the Antichrist. Now, we want to go to the book of Daniel. You've noticed that we've spent a lot of time in the book of Daniel. Why? Well, the book of Daniel is a a prophetic book. There's prophecies, and we're interested in that. We, we, We call this whole series Prophecies of Hope. But we've seen that prophecies not just predict the future, but they show us that God is in control. Amen? God God loves us. God has a plan for us. And so we're here in Daniel, and I want you to go to Daniel chapter 7. What chapter, everyone? Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. There in the middle of the Bible, Daniel chapter 7. Now, I want you to pull out your study guide there, and and notice there, now we're on the the third page, okay, we open it up, and now we're on that third page, fold that over, and there's a title that may be considered odd. It says, Four Frightening, Ferocious, Feral Creatures. Can someone say alliteration? All right. Four Frightening, Ferocious, Feral Creatures. Interesting. Well, what are we going to see? My friends, you're going to find out. Now, don't forget, don't forget that Daniel is a symbolic book. Daniel is a what book, my friends? Symbolic. Daniel and Revelation are twin books. And over and over, we we find these beasts and we, we find these scary images. And we may think, well, what are you talking about, God? But we find that they actually mean something. God, God is not a God of confusion. God does not want you to be confused, my friends. He wants you to understand the Bible. And yes, it takes a little study, and and it takes maybe a little hard work, but we can understand this chapter, Daniel chapter 7. Now, God does something very interesting here. God does something interesting, and and he uses this principle called review and enlarge. Review and enlarge. You see that there at the bottom, review and enlarge. Now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you are, are teachers? Maybe you've taught before, you're, okay, work at a school, excellent. Now, I would say, 
I would, I would guess that all of you teachers have used this principle before, review and enlarge. What do I mean? When you go from the sixth grade to the seventh grade, there now you're in seventh grade, I guarantee you that the teacher is going to, now that you're in seventh grade, spend some time reviewing what you learned in sixth grade, right? He's not just going to throw you in the mess and say, hey, go do the algebra, you know, like, good luck. Absolutely not. Hey, what did we learn before? What did we learn in year six? Okay, now that we reviewed year six, let's go to year seven. I, re I remember my sixth grade teacher well, Mrs. Julie Priest. Amazing teacher, beautiful lady, still one of our family friends. And, and then I moved from sixth grade to seventh grade, Mr. Rick Stitzer. And there at Coble Elementary in Calhoun, Georgia, great teacher. And Mr. Stitzer spent some time at the beginning of the year going over what we learned. What, what did we talk about? What information did we gather? Then after we reviewed sixth grade, he enlarged upon that. He gave us more. Does that make sense, everyone? Well, God is a good teacher as well. And he wants to also use this principle. And so he begins to review in Daniel 7 now. Some of you were here the first night. How many of you were here the very first night? Raise your hand. Excellent. Most of us. Most of you will remember and recognize this statue. We find the statue in Daniel chapter 2, and we find that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And he has this dream of this great metal man. But in that dream, we find that that metal man you see on the screen is a great timeline. It's a great what, everyone? A timeline, this big timeline of history and these different metals, the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver and the belly of bronze and the legs of iron, the, the feet of, of iron and clay, they all represent nations. And, and, and so we've seen that, that Babylon came along and then Medo-Persia conquered Babylon and, and then Greece and then Rome and then divided Rome. Look at it in any history book, they're going to give you the same order and the same dates. And God predicted it all before it's going to even happen, amen? But we find here... We find here in Daniel, not metals, but beasts. Not metals, but beasts. My friends, go there and we're going to read, we're going to read verse 1 through verse 7. I know it's a lot of verses. You want to follow along. It's not going to be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read some verses here in this chapter. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Okay, he had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. We've all had dreams before, and, and Daniel now has a vision, and he, he wrote down the dream for us, telling the main facts. Verse 2, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Okay, there's, there's this big, great ocean, this great sea, and Daniel sees in this, this vision, these great winds stirring up the sea. But notice what happens next. He says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion with had angel's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. Interesting. But he sees another beast. He sees a second like a bear, and this one is raised up on one side. And how many ribs did it have in its mouth? Three ribs. This is verse 5. And they said to it, arise, devour much flesh. Notice verse 6. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. Notice what he says. He says, after this I looked. And behold, there was another beast like a leopard, and it had four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion. With, whoo, there's a lot of beasts here. Verse 7. After this, Daniel sees another beast. He can't even describe this beast. This beast is so crazy, he doesn't even have a name for it. What does it look like? After this, I saw in the night visions a fourth beast, dreadful and, and terribly strong. It had iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts, and it had five horns on its head. Ten horns. Good, you're a smart group. Ten horns were on this beast's head. Interesting. So, so Daniel sees these different beasts. He sees these different beasts. Now, we just saw what these beasts were. There, there was the lion, and it had these, these great wings. And then there was this, this bear, and it had three ribs in its mouth, and it's lopsided. And then he saw this four-headed leopard. And then he saw this terrible beast that he can't even describe with ten horns. What is going on? My friends, remember 
that God uses that great teaching principle of review and enlarge. How many beasts does Daniel see here in Daniel 7? Four beasts. How many main metals were there? Four. There was gold, there was silver, there was bronze, and there was iron. Four beasts, four main metals. And how many horns were on that last beast? Ten horns. My friends, how many toes do you have? Yeah, smart group. Ten. Ten toes. And we remember, we saw this in Daniel chapter 2. There in Daniel 2, we saw that Rome was not conquered from without, but divided from within. You go to any history book today, go to a library, look it up, you will find that no nation conquered Rome. There in 476 AD, no nation conquered. Ten tribes came in and started picking Rome apart by the scene. That's exactly what happened. And God predicted it. And so here this last beast has ten horns. Why? It represents the same thing the ten toes did. Those ten tribes coming in. Those ten tribes coming in. Look at there, those beasts again. Now, this is very important. You notice that the beasts come out of where? They come out of the water. Now, I am not one of those people that, that, that uh, ascribes to this whole, you know, well, you know, if, if you, if you uh, times seven by seven, you get 49, and then, then you look up every 49th verse in every book, and then you add those together, and you get some, you know, some people just go through the Bible picking apart random things. Well, this means that, and that means that. And so I'm not at all saying, well, every single thing here is symbolic, but I'm interested in what the Bible has to say. The Bible is its own interpreter. So, so we find that the water here actually represents something. Notice Revelation 17, 15. It says, the waters which you saw are what? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So water represents a populated area. Now you say, well, hey, this is in Revelation. I thought we were in Daniel. Ah, Remember, Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. They're twin books. It's end time prophecy. So, you, you know, you can't go to, to any place that says, well, Jesus was baptized in water. So that means he was baptized in a populated area. No, 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 no. Only when we're talking about end time Bible prophecy. Does that make sense, everyone? So we see that these nations come out of a populated area. My friends, did Babylon, did Medo Persia, did Greece, did Rome? Did they come out of a populated, absolutely. That, that area there, there in, in, in central Europe there in the Middle East, that was, that was the then known world. That's where everyone lived. Isn't the Bible an awesome book? The Bible is an awesome book. So we, we find here, my friends, that yes, indeed, yes, indeed, those four beasts correspond with what Daniel has in Daniel chapter 2 perfectly. I mean, notice that the that, that, that head of gold represented Babylon. Well, here, the winged lion represents Babylon. I mean, isn't the lion, that's the king of the jungle, right? We sing that here sometimes in church. Who's the king of the jungle? Yeah, you've heard that song? The kids sing that, right? The, 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 the lion's the king of the jungle. He's the most noble of the animals. So God says, all right, all right, I'm, I'm going to use a lion to represent Babylon. And then he says, okay, okay, the bear that's imbalanced on one side, that's the same as the chest and arms of silver. That's Medo-Persia. How do we know that? My friends, why was the bear ba imbalanced on one side? He was leaning on his side. Medo-Persia was an imbalanced nation. They leagued together to capture Babylon, but Persia was the stronger nation. And so obviously God would use a bear that's imbalanced. Fascinating. Those three ribs in the mouse, well, in the mouth, did you, did you know that Medo-Persia actually captured three kingdoms? Not just Babylon, but look in the history book, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Wow, wow, God, God here predicts that in the Bible. Notice that the, the bronze thighs, which represented Greece, is represented by that four-headed, what creature was that? A leopard, wow, a leopard. Now, why were there four heads? Man, this is so interesting. Why were there four heads? My friends, remember Alexander the Great, he died at the age of 32 in a drunken stupor. Yes, he was a great, mighty conqueror, and he could conquer worlds, but he couldn't conquer himself, as one historian noted. And there he dies in a drunken stupor, and he has no heir. There's no one to take 
his place. And so four generals come on, look this up, look it up, and four generals come in and they start taking over Greece. They start commanding Greece. Hmm, is it any coincidence that it was a four-headed leopard? I don't think so. There are the legs of iron represented by that ferocious, that, that, that nondescript beast with those ten horns. Interesting. Those ten horns representing divided how do I, well, How do you know it's divided Europe? Well, my friends, remember, remember, remember. Rome was not conquered, it was divided. Ten tribes, they came in there, look it up in the history books, they came in and they divided Rome. And those ten tribes spread out. The Franks, they became France, and et cetera. All these different tribes became the modern nations of Europe that we have today. And so God says here in Daniel 7, hey, those ten horns on that beast's head, those represent those ten tribes. Man, does God know what he's talking about? Amen. Now, why would God use beasts to represent nations? I mean, why would he do that? Well, we do the same thing today, don't we? What, what, what nation is an eagle associated with? The U.S. Well, well, what about a bear? Does anyone know? Russia. Well, what about a dragon? China. Well, we do the same thing today. There's certain, there's certain beasts or animals that represent nations. And so God does the exact same thing. But remember, the Bible interprets itself. Notice there in chapter 7, open your Bibles there, and look there, look there in verse, look there in verse 23. Actually, verse 17, excuse me. Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Notice what it says. It says very plainly, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings who arise out of the earth. You can't say much plainer than that. I'm not, you know, I'm not guessing what this is. You say, oh, Jeff, you say that's what those beasts are. But no, that's what the Bible says. It says right there, verse 17, those great beasts are four kings, which shall, wow, the Bible interprets itself. The Bible interprets itself. And my friends, I want you to know, again, that I am not just making this up. I mean, historians have said the same thing. We, we looked at this quote, Edward Gibbons, a, a number of days ago. This is Edward Gibbons in a book called Decline and Fall of Roman Empire. He's a secular historian. He has zero interest uh, in, in Christianity. He was against religion. And notice what he says. The images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Wow, where did he get that language from? The book of Daniel, a secular historian. But my friends, to show you again that I'm not making this up, I've not been here myself, but in Nuremberg, Germany, there's a courthouse. And, and this, is, this is a sound historical inter- interpretation, my friends. You can't really see it. We'll blow it up. But, but here on the edge of that courthouse, you notice some different characters and creatures. Notice there, uh, there on the left, you see a winged lion. Do you see that there? A winged lion. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was, he was in charge of Babylon. And right next to him, a winged lion. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's what Daniel saw. He saw this winged lion representing Babylon. I'm not the only one who's saying this. Notice the other side. There's, there's that bear, that imbalanced bear, sitting this lion there on one side. Interesting. And there's... There's Cyrus the Great, Medo-Persia. But then you go to the other side, and you notice there, there on the left, there's Alexander the Great with that four-headed, what was it? Leopard. Interesting. You go to the other side, and there's the, 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 the conqueror of Rome, and there is that beast. And how many horns are there? Ten. Ten. My friends, I'm not making this up. Other people say the same thing. This is a sound historical interpretation. You look in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, God predicted those nations which would come. But notice this. You can barely see it. I don't have a zoom up. But you notice that there's something on that horn. What is it? What is it? Let's go to the Bible to find out. Let's go to the Bible to find out. Daniel is still dreaming here. This is verse 8. Daniel's still dreaming. Notice he says in verse 8, Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Look, look at there in your own Bible. It's right there. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. He says, I, Daniel, was considering the horns. Now, what does it mean to consider? 
to think about. Daniel was thinking about the horns. Which horns? The ten horns of the beast he had just seen. He had just seen these ten horns of this beast, and he's kind of scratching his head. Hmm, those were interesting. He's, in his vision, he's looking at those horns, considering the horns, but then notice what Daniel sees. He sees there, I was considering the horns, verse 8, and there was another horn, a, a little one, and it was, what was it doing? Coming up among the other horns. And it says before three of the first horns were, were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking, what kind of words? Pompous, blasphemous words. Interesting. Here, here Daniel sees these 10 horns. He's looking at them, but then notice there, he sees this one horn, this little one, and, and is that a good representation of a horn right there? All right, I'm trying. All right, he sees this little horn and, it, and it's growing up out of the other ones. And in fact, the Bible says that it pushes or it uproots three of the other horns. There were 10 tribes that went there into Rome. We're going to look at this in a second, but my friends, three of them are extinct today. Interesting. This is what this says. It says the Bible right here, the little horn, it says that it pushes its way up. But notice, notice what Daniel sees. What is on that little horn. Say it again. Eyes. He sees these two eyes on this horn and, and a mouth of a man speaking pompous words. My friends, who is this little horn? I mean, it came out of these 10 horns, these, these 10 tribes, and, and it pushes out three of the other ones, and, it's, and it's, it's there, and it's speaking like a man, and it's speaking blasphemous words. We just read that, that horns represent kingdoms. I mean, those 10 horns of that beast represent the kingdoms. So this has to re represent some sort of kingdom. But who exactly is this Antichrist? Well, I'm not going to tell you yet. We want to look at 10 identifying characteristics of this little horn. And you're going to see, my friends, it is the Antichrist. 10 identifying characteristics. And my friends, this is there on, on that back page. I want you to write these down. Turn that page. You can write the verses as well that we'll be looking at. And my friends, we're going to be looking at the characteristics of the little horn. Okay? The little horn. So notice there the first characteristic. It says it's a little kingdom. How, how do we know that this little horn, it's a little kingdom? Well, my friends, notice there in verse 8. He was considering the horns, these, these 10 large horns that are sticking out, and there was another horn. What kind of one? A little one. It, it was just beginning to grow. It was a baby horn that was just beginning to gain power. It's a little kingdom. But it also comes from among them. How do we know? Verse 8. It says, I was considering the horns. There was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them. There it is, right there in verse 8. You can write verse 8 next to the second identifying mark. Verse 8 will tell you it comes up from among them. Now, who is them? Who is them? Comes up from among them. Who, who's them? Th those 10 horns. Those 10 horns. Because remember, there were 10 horns that Daniel saw, but then he sees another one, this, this little horn, and it grows up among them. Fascinating. But then notice verse 4. Or excuse me, verse, or the, the second one. Uh, the third one, man, I'm confused. There we go, I got that out. The third one, the third identifying characteristic, it says, after them. A after who? After the horn. H how do we know that it's after them? H how do we know that this little horn comes up after them? It says there in verse 8. It says, as, as he was considering these horns, here's these 10 horns, but all of a sudden another one comes up after them. Now, 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 I want you to turn there to verse 24. This will explain it even more clearly. The Bible always interprets itself, and you'll find there in, in verses 23 and 24 and 25 an uh, interpretation of what you just read. Look at verse 24. It says, the ten horns are ten kings. There it says, the Bible says there, there's ten kingdoms who shall arise from this kingdom, and uh, another shall arise when? After them. He shall be different from the other ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall uproot three kings. There it is. We, we just saw the fourth 
identifying characteristic is, it plucks up three. No, notice what the Bible says there in verse 24. He shall be different and he shall subdue three kings. Wow, we're, we're gaining this picture of who this antichrist, who this little horn is. He shall be different or diverse. We saw that again in verse 24. What about the last five? A man at its head. Remember that little horn, remember? And remember, it, it, it has eyes like a man. You see that there in verse eight. Notice verse eight, it says, eyes like a man and a mouth speaking words. So, so we know that, that some sort of central figure is at the head of this little horn. Number seven, it speaks blasphemy. There you notice in verse 25, it says, verse 25, look at there, chapter 7, verse 25, the little horn shall speak pompous or blasphemous words against the Most High. Now, if I ask you the question, what is blasphemy, what would you say? It's, it's bad. It's not good, right? Well, what, what does the Bible say? All right, we're interested in what the Bible, what is the Bible definition of blasphemy? Well, we're going to explore that. The first biblical definition of blasphemy is there in Mark 2.7. Mark 2.7, here they're talking to, about Jesus, and they say, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they told Jesus, Jesus, you're committing blasphemy because you're claiming to forgive sins. Only God can do that. But was Jesus actually committing blasphemy? Why not? He was God. But if I claim to forgive sins, would I be committing blasphemy? That's what the Bible says. John 10, 33, second definition, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So there they're talking to Jesus again. And they say, listen, Jesus, you claim to be God. That's blasphemy. Was Jesus actually being blasphemous by claiming to be God? No. Why? He was God. But if I claim to be God, I would be committing blasphemy. There, verse, or the second, uh, the third definition, 1 Timothy, says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Now, who is writing here? Paul. What was Paul's first name? Saul. Saul openly went around in the name of God, persecuting, there he says, a blasphemer. He was a, a persecutor. In the name of God, he was persecuting. So the three definitions from the Bible of blasphemy are, and let's go back, three Bible definitions. The first one, claiming to forgive sins on earth. The second one, claiming to be God. And the third one, persecuting in God's name. Persecuting God's people in God's name. Interesting. And that is what the Bible says, this little horn power, that's what it says. That's what it says the little horn power is doing. It is committing blasphemy. Now that, that number eight there, persecuting power. We, we see that in verse 25. Look, look at there in, in Daniel 7 and verse 25. You'll notice it says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, or blasphemous words, and he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. So the little horn, the Bible tells us, is going to persecute the saints. That's what the Bible says. Notice the ninth description. This is all in verse 25. You can write that across from in your study guide. This is all in verse 25. It says, this power shall, what's that word? Uh, there in the middle, it shall intend to change times and laws. That's right there in the middle of verse 25. It shall intend to change times and laws. Now, this is not just a, the speed limit or a, a Fallbrook city ordinance. This is the law of God, God's law itself. This is what it, the Bible says, that little horn power intends to change God's law. Lastly, this little horn power rules for 1,260 prophetic days. And you're thinking, where in the world did you get that number? Allow me to explain. Stay with me. Notice the end of verse 25. It says, he shall intend to change times and law, the little horn. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for how long? A time, a times, 
and half a time. A time, then times, plural, and then half a time. Time, times, and half a time. Now, now we could get into, this is, this is deep biblical stuff, but this, this is good stuff. Now, 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 in Revelation, you find that same time period. It's actually over seven times in Daniel and Revelation, you find that same time period. But you kind of notice it used different ways. In Revelation, he actually says 1,260 days. He also says 42 months. How many days are in 42 months? 1,260 days. But then we also find this phrase, time, times it. How can you get 1,260 days from that? Well, it's actually not that complicated. It, here in Daniel, a time is one. Times, with plural, is two, right? Time is one. Times in Daniel is two. And half a time is half. I mean, half a, a time is right half. So you have one time, times two, and then half a time, a half. So one, two, and a half. That adds up to three and a half. So, so here the Bible says three and a half prophetic years. Now stay with me. I know some of you are like, whoo, what, what, what are you doing? Well, last night we talked about this principle. This is a, a sound, a true biblical principle. You can find it in Ezekiel. You can find it in Numbers. We saw it last night in Daniel chapter 9. That is this. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals what? One prophetic year. One literal year. One prophetic day equals one literal year. So three and a half prophetic years is 1,260 days, which is actually 1,260 years. Now, now, my friends, I know that's an introduction to some of you may be thinking, you lost me way back there at, at, you know, time, times, half a time. That's fine if this is an introduction. When I first read this prophecy, it was an introduction. But, but as you begin to build this biblical picture, these things begin to become more clear. But, 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 but know, my friends, that this little power, the Bible says, this little power, it's a little kingdom. It comes up from among them or among the ten horns, the ten tribes there that are modern-day Europe. It comes up after them. It comes up after those ten tribes. It plucks up three. It's diverse. It's different than the other horns. It's got a man in its head. It speaks blasphemy, the Bible says. And remember those three biblical definitions of blasphemy. It claims to forgive sins. It claims to be God. And it persecutes people, God's people, in the name of God. It changes the times and laws or thinks to change them. And then it rules for 1,260 prophetic days. And now, my friends, I want to and we need to very humbly approach the word of God. Amen? We need to look at it. Okay, that's what the Bible, we just got that from the Bible. That, that's not what I said. That's not what, what, what anyone else, that's what, that's what we see in Scripture. And so uh, I know that, that over time, uh, this has become, wow. Time and time again, God's word has proven to be true. And I know that many of you have had that same experience. Time and time again, we've found that we can trust the Bible. We can trust the Bible. And so here, when God gives us this information, it's not sent to, to, to cut us down. It's not sent to destroy us. Bible truth is always sent to save us, amen? amen. So we, we find this little horn power. It has these, these 10 identifying characteristics. And the question remains, who is this little horn? Who is this antichrist figure? Now, now, I told you at the beginning, I told you at the beginning that I wanted you to look at those identifying marks. I wanted you to to. to, 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 to to, to, to think about this prophecy, and I wanted you to guess, but I don't want you to guess. I want you to think, think clearly. What, what, what is Daniel talking about? That's what I, I want to know what God has to say, amen? Now, my friends, before we go any further, I want to make the point clear. Is God against people? Absolutely not. My friends, God loves people, amen? Amen? He loves people. And time and time again, he's displayed his love toward his people. God is not against people. But God is against systems 
that take the threefold ministry of Jesus. That, 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 that say that they minister in Christ's place, that say that, that they, they forgive sins in Christ's place, that, that say that they persecute in Christ's place, that, that say that, that they're the greatest, that they rule in Christ's place. My, my, my friends, can you imagine? I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would be concerned if, if one of you went around to, to the Fallbrook and went around to Temecula and started spreading rumors saying, hey, this guy's talking about that. He's saying this and that. Hey, that's, and if, if you were... Not telling, I would be concerned. If you were misrepresenting who I was, wouldn't you be concerned? Yes, I would be concerned. And so God loves people. God loves people. My friends, I, I, I am an American citizen. I'm an American citizen. And, and, and as an American citizen, there's some things that in the past America was involved with that I'll be honest, I'm not proud of. I'm not, I'm not proud of the slave trade. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of, of that involved. I'm not proud of, of the way the indigenous people were treated. But because I'm an American citizen, does that make me a bad person? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, that does not make me a bad person. So my friends, before we go any further, remember that, that God loves people. He sends Bible truth to save, Amen. He doesn't send Bible truth to embarrass. He doesn't, he doesn't send Bible truth to, to, to make us feel like, oh, I can't believe God just told me that. Absolutely not. So, my friends, when this next, this next slide on the screen appears, I, I don't want you to be embarrassed if you're affiliated with this system. That's all right. God loves you. Amen? So, these 10 identifying marks, these 10, we're going to go back through them. But who do they represent? Who do they represent? Is it a hand and glove fit? Oh, we're going to see that. The Roman, what's that word? Church, state. We want to approach this humbly, my friends. But, but I see in Scripture, I see in Scripture, and I'm not making fun of everyone. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm just saying I see in Scripture that possibly the Roman church state fits these descriptions. Let's go back through. Let's go back through. Remember, the first one, it's a little kingdom, right? It's a little kingdom. The, the, the Vatican there is, is actually, it's, it's known as a kingdom, right? It's, it's its own state. It's its own entity. It's actually, you know, you, you, you go there today and you'll find that they, they, they have their, their own buildings and their own lines. It's a little kingdom. It, does it come up among them? What, what, what does that mean? Well, remember, the little horn came up among the what? The ten horns. It, it came up the, from the divided tribes of Europe. The modern day, is that where Rome came, came from? Absolutely. It didn't come from, from Tokyo. It, it didn't come from Australia. No, no, no. It came from those, those 10 tribes. Then the Bible says it came up after them. A after what? Well, if we remember, if we remember, Rome ended, do you remember what, what year? 476 AD. That's when Rome ended. That's when the tribes came in and they took over Rome. That's, that's, that, that, you can look in history. That's what happened. So we would be expecting, we would be expecting this, this power to come up after that. We're going to find later a, a quote just, just in a little bit that in 538 AD, the Roman church state came onto the scene. That's very much after 476, isn't it? It's not 230. It's not 240. It's not 300. No, that's after 476, 4, 538. So yes, it fits that as well. Plucks up three. Plucks up three. Now, now this is very, very brief. And I know you have to know a little history to explain this. But remember those three tribes? There was the Ostergras and, and, and there was a couple others. Well, three of them, three of them, the Roman church state said, you know what? Those are Aryan tribes. Those are Aryan tribes and they don't believe in the preeminence of Jesus. And so the, the, the bishop there of Rome sent Justinian to those three different tribes, and he had them destroyed. And so, and today, you won't find any descendants from those ten tribes. Interesting. So, so, so yeah, indeed, yes, indeed, this little horn power plucks up three or roots up three of those nations. It's diverse. It's different. Notice what Alexander Flick there says in the rise of the medieval church, page 168. It says, the bishop of Rome in the, the seat of Caesar was now the greatest man in the West and was so or was soon forced to become the political 
as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, and sense of glory. And every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city in the ecclesiastical capital. Notice what he says next. Civil, as well as religious disputes, were refute, or excuse me, referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. So yes, indeed, we find that this little horn was different. Here, here, here it says about Rome that this entity, this system, didn't just have political, but also religious power. It wasn't just a religious entity. It combined the two. So yes, those other horns, remember the ten horns, they were nations. They were kings. England, there's a nation. France, there's a France. But here spiritual or ecclesiastical Rome is a little different. It combines both civil and both religious powers. When Constantinople moved his entire capital city to to now, um, or excuse me, um, when when, uh, Constantinople was moved, um, it's it's, it's now in Istanbul, there there, uh, he was given, the bishop of Rome, he was given the power of of the Western Roman Empire. He, He was. And there he was told, hey, I'm going to be gone now. The capital's now moving to Constantinople, to Istanbul, and now you take charge. Even civil and religious matters. Notice there, number six, man at its head. Man at its head. Of course, yes, the the Pope is there in head of the Roman church state. Speaks blasphemy. Now, my friends, I want to pause again. I, 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 I almost, uh, am, am, you know, I don't want anyone to think that, again, we're, oh, we're pointing fingers, we're making fun. Not at all. Not at all. And this is from their own sources. Remember those three biblical definitions, claims to forgive sins, claims to be God on earth, persecutes people in the name of God. Notice their dignity and duties of the priest. It says, were the redeemer to descend into a church, and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in a confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, ego de absolvo. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, ego de absolvo. And the penitents of each would be equally absolved. Interesting. Here, here this quote tells us that, that if Jesus forgives, let's say, Mary... But then a priest forgives John. They're both equally forgiven. Wasn't wasn't that one of the biblical definitions of blasphemy? Notice this next quote. The bishop of Rome is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the bishop of Rome speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. The great encyclical letters of Leo We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. So my friends, we see in history that yes, indeed, this little horn power speaks blasphemy. Yes, indeed, this little horn power is a persecuting power. The Roman church state has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. The Dark Ages are called the dark ages because the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light. And during that dark age period, that 1,260 year period, there was no Bible. The Bible was illegal. You couldn't have the Bible. It was in Latin. It was chained there to the wall and no one could read it. Notice there, it also intends to change the times and the law. The Bishop of Rome is of so great authority and of power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as a representative of God upon earth. And lastly, my friends, this little horn power reigns for 1,260 prophetic days. Notice here in the History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. It says the Roman church state's power became supreme in Christendom in what year? 538 AD. Due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian known as Justinian's Decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all the churches. 
It gave the Roman church state political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. This letter became part of Justinian's code, the fundamental law of the empire. And that year, Pope Vigilus ascended the throne under the military protection of Vesalarius. Interesting. There, there, there it says that, that in 538 AD, that is when the Roman church state came to power. Well, if we start there in 530 AD and we go forward... 1,260 years, what time period do we come to? 1798 A.D. My friends, what happened in 1798 A.D.? There in 1798 A.D., Napoleon, Napoleon sent his general there, Berthier, and disposes the Bishop of Rome. And so, yes, indeed, that entity fits all of these 10 identifying marks. Now, my friends, once again, once again, notice there on the screen, Bible truth is never sent to discourage, overwhelm, or humiliate us. Amen? Bible truth is sent to save us. And my friends, I I humbly come before the word of God saying, "All, all right, Lord, I want to know what the word says. And, and yes, it, it's easy to, well, we want to shy away from this, but we want to know what, the, we want to know what God is up to, don't we? And, and here he sends us Bible truth, and, and, and it's somber, and we're not pointing, we're not making fun at all. And my friends, please, if you know someone or if you're a part of, of, of that system, please don't be embarrassed. Don't, don't, don't feel like I'm, I'm attacking you because I'm not at all, not at all. God sends Bible truth to save us. What, what, what's the difference between a surgeon and a butcher? A surgeon cuts to heal, but a, a butcher cuts to kill, right? My friends, God is the best surgeon in the entire world. And I will admit that sometimes when I read the word of God, I'm cut to the heart. I say, Lord, really? Really, God? And it hurts. But God is, is in this healing process, and, and he's taking this truth in God's word, and, and, and there's times where I read the Bible and I say, whew, Lord, Lord, that is me. God, I'm sorry, I need, to, I need to change that. But God is in the business of healing. He's in the business of restoring, because he's coming a day when, wow, all flesh will be with God, that accept Jesus Christ as Lord. That, that worship God in spirit and in truth. So my friends, we've seen tonight, we've seen tonight that the Bible is trustworthy. We've seen tonight that, that, that once again, God predicted history. And, and we've seen that God is, loves people, he's not against people, but he's naturally concerned about, about systems that misrepresent his true character. But God is in the business of saving and healing. Praise God. Praise God. And so, my friends, I want you to sincerely, to humbly think about what was said tonight. I know it's a serious topic. And I I want you to to come before God and say, Lord, what do you want to teach me? Check it out for yourself. Please don't take my word for it. Go go in there to the books of Daniel and, and Revelation and read it for yourself. Go to the library. Check out the history books. Don't take my word for it. Take the Bible's word for it. Check it out yourself. And think about it and study it in the days to come and see what the Lord puts upon your heart. My friends, we serve an awesome God, don't we? And, 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 and God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and for me. And he's coming again to take his people home. Amen? Amen. Why don't we close asking God to be with us and to guide us in the coming days and months? Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord, we have been convicted by your word tonight. Lord, I've been convicted. And Lord, I thank you that you always send truth to save us, Lord, to heal us. And Lord, I want to worship you the way that you want me to worship you. Lord, I, I, want, to, I want to follow you for who you are. And so, Lord, I praise you for the Bible that teaches us about the nature of your will for us. 
And Lord, as we leave this place, will you encourage us? As we leave this place, will you give us peace that surpasses all understanding? Lord, you promise in your word, you promise that, that, that we don't have to be anxious about anything. We don't have to be worried, Lord, because you are with us. And so now, oh, oh Jesus, we're, 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 we're claiming in your name that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus, we're claiming in your name the promises that tell us that, 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 that you are coming again. We cannot wait to see your face, oh God. And Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. And we pray these things in your name, the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. And everyone here said, amen, amen, amen. My friends, may God's word continue to bless you. May God's word continue to give you strength. May God's word continue to encourage you.